proper identification of reactive chemicals following safe handling practices and knowing what to do in an emergency can prevent a disastrous accident. What can happen when these precautions break down? Perhaps no more graphic example is available in real life than the catastrophe of Texas City, Texas on April 16, 1947. For that story, we're going to interview Mr. Ezra Stokes, who remembers that fateful day and its aftermath all too well. Mr. Stokes, I understand you were working as a chemical engineer at a plant near Texas City back then. Oh, they knew it was used as an oxidizer and high explosives, but nobody thought it could be detonated just by heat or fire. Why, there weren't even any no smoking signs aboard that French ship. Well, anyway, one of the crew saw smoke coming out of the hole. They dumped a little drinking water on it and hit it with a hand extinguisher to no effect. So then they were going to flood it with water, which was the right thing to do. But they didn't want to ruin the cargo. So they battened down the hatches, sealed the ventilators, and turned on the ship's fire smothering steam system. All that did was raise the temperature and fuel the oxidation. Pretty soon the hatch covers were blowing off due to the pressure and the thick orange smoke was pouring out. Well, that was due to the burning chemicals decomposing into nitrous oxide, you see. Finally, the city's volunteer firemen arrived on the dock, along with a whole lot of sight seals. About the time the firemen started laying out their lines, why, all hell broke loose. Yes, sir, that ship blew up like an acre of TNT. Why, people heard it 150 miles away, and it registered on a seismograph in Denver, Colorado. You see? That ammonium nitrate had been allowed to reach just the right combination of heat, pressure, and contamination from the burning paper bags and wood in the holes, and it did the unthinkable. It detonated. Why, that explosion was so powerful that it ignited the Monsanto styling plant across the harbor, where they were storing highly flammable benzene and propane. Why, it knocked two small planes out of the sky and they found a 10-foot section of the Grand Camp's propeller four miles away. So the burning debris ignited another ship, the High Flyer, which was also loaded with ammonium nitrate and sulfur. Several hours later, that ship exploded, caused by a different reaction caused by the burning sulfur. All told, 552 people were killed, 3,000 injured, and the damage cost over $50 million. And that's 1947 dollars. Incredible, Mr. Stokes, and a terribly costly lesson in the hazards of reactive chemicals, wasn't it? Oh, yes. Now we have warning labels in MSPS on ammonium nitrate and other such chemicals. You know to keep its temperature down. And if it burns to dissolve it with water, not steam, if only people that were handling this stuff could pay attention to what they're doing. That's what Hancom is all about, Mr. Stokes, understanding and using what we know. Thanks for being with us. The primary methods of controlling unstable and reactive chemicals are segregation and containment. But how do you know which chemicals need to be segregated from each other in your workplace? The MSDS and your company's special handling procedures are two very good guidelines. 